the ideas and the concepts I learned from the military carry over into the baseball card world. Hi, I'm Robert Myron, and this is Consigner Confidential. Started collecting baseball cards when I was about six, seven years old with my dad. We enjoyed collecting baseball cards together, going to games, watching the games on TV. My dad would get real excited when the Yankees hit a home run, the New York Rangers would score a goal. My dad would bring home boxes of baseball cards, and we'd open the packs. My first baseball card was 1984 Tops, Don Mattingly. At 16 years old, we'd run baseball card shows in a little town of Milford where I grew up. When I was 17 and 18 years old, I branched out to Cooperstown. So my love for collecting kind of grew. Sharing that time with my father from an early age was very rewarding for both of us. My senior year of high school in December of 1997, I needed a way to pay for college. So I'd made the decision to join the Army National Guard. I just wanted to give it a break for a while and do something that was uh, bigger than myself and the Army provided that opportunity. One week after graduation in June of 1998, I left for basic training and started at the lowest rank. I had finished the in-processing stations a day early, thinking I could start basic training early and get out of there. The Army had other ideas and put me on a day of kitchen duty, washing pots and pans all day long before basic training started. Halfway through, they threw the uniform on me it's me really questioning my uh, life's decision at that point. It's pretty funny. It's definitely one of my fondest of memories. In those initial years, I rose to the rank of uh, Specialist E4 when I decided to go to Officer Candidate School. This picture here is where I graduated Officer Candidate School. It's the first day of being a U.S. Army officer. The School of Advanced Military Studies is located in Fort Leavenworth, Missouri. A very prestigious school, a very difficult school to get into. Once you get into it, it's also very demanding. It's produced the war planners from the Persian Gulf all the way to today. The war planners earned the nickname Jedi by uh, General Schwarzkopf, who was the commanding general of, of the Persian Gulf War. So throughout the course, you're reading two to 300 pages a day, every other day. It's a lot, it beats you down, but you learn a lot and you evolve and you change as a person. Three quarters of the way through, I just needed to find some balance and I started to go back to my days collecting baseball cards. One of the things you learn in the military is info operations and the power of information and knowledge. You learn how to research, you learn how to get on top of a lot of information quickly and be able to turn that into something on the fly. I have a Microsoft Excel document. I call it my strategy document. As I'm researching PSA, SGC, golden auctions, past sales, I'll start to jot down the big cards that I think are undervalued and have low populations out there. It's important to research, it's important to study, it's important to understand the information, memorize the information, to have all that knowledge at the ready. You can make decisions rapidly and seal deals before somebody else gets to them. Because quite honestly, the internet moves fast. And if you don't get to the deal first, um, somebody's gonna be right up behind you within a matter of seconds and you'll lose the deal. Baseball cards is always fun. It's the thrill of the hunt, which relates to the military. It's a game of chance. It's a game of probabilities. 1963 Topps, number 537, Pete Rose rookie card. The 1963 Topps card stock is very difficult to grade. The 1933 Gaudi Lou Gehrig, a prestigious card in the industry that we felt was seriously undervalued. Given Lou Gehrig's Hall of Fame career, being a New York Yankee, the probability that card would increase in value, even past today, well into the future, is very high. The 1933 Babe Ruth Gowdy is obviously a card that's gonna increase in value over time. It's almost a zero risk investment. The 1965 Topps Joe Namath is extremely undervalued card, even today, even right now. It's very hard to find that card in any kind of condition. The 1987 Michael Jordan, his second year card, we were able to obtain a PSA 10. Anything Michael Jordan, that's a zero risk, no brainer decision. 
The Mickey Mantle 1957 Topps PSA 8 is a great card. High grade Mickey Mantle, anytime you're able to get one of those, you have to jump on it. Any investment in that is really zero risk. His popularity, his notoriety, the low population, the vintage idea, it's gonna to continue to go up in value. My friend used to always tell me, Mickey Mantles don't go bad. The 1939 play ball, PSA 7 Joe DiMaggio should be right up there with Mickey Mantle, maybe just below. If you do the research, you quickly realize that this card is extremely undervalued. Given an increase in demand, this card will rise very quickly. Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Joe Namath, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, those careers are never going to change. They are set in stone. That history is etched forever, and nothing's gonna change that. As far as risk goes, the risk is almost zero. In the card collecting hobby, nobody can buy all the baseball cards out there. It's just simply impossible. There's enough cards for everybody. Since I like to research and I like to study and I like to get on top of information, I like to share that information with people in the hobby and help them be successful as well. Over the last two years, I've had a few people who've trusted me and trusted my advice and have done very well. And that's where the true joy comes in. It gives you energy, it gives fulfillment, and uh, builds lifelong friendships and relationships that go way beyond any monetary value. I don't think I get back into the baseball card hobby without my experience through School of Advanced Military Studies. It opened me up to not only the baseball market, but so many ideas. It made me evolve as a person, uh, turned me into, I guess, kind of a Jedi.